Tonight's our program is about the theme of adaptive reuse of historic buildings uh, using the case studies of the Rock Wenzhou Museum in Shanghai and Daegu for comparative studies. And this talk is also a very special collaborative event um, supported by the Built Heritage um, um, Collaborative Research of Hong Kong Urban Labs at Hong Kong Youth Faculties of um, Architecture. And this is also supported by the Hong Kong chapter of Dr. Momo. We are honored to have the co-founder um, and the president of Dokomomo Hong Kong, Dr. Cecilia Chu, to be the moderator of tonight's Diagon Conversation. Without further ado, I will pass the, micro the microphone to Cecilia. And good evening, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be here. So uh, the rundown tonight, we will begin with Yang giving a talk first for about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, I will then raise just a couple questions to kick off kickstart the discussions, and this will be followed by a Q&A sessions. So, Ying, I will now pass on to you. Today's presentation unpacks these two cases from two cities that both had inceptions at a moment in history in the middle of the 1800s. In Hong Kong, the former Central Police Station, which has been converted um, into the Arts and Heritage Hub today known as Daikun, where we are, and in Shanghai, the redevelopment of the block around the former Royal Asiatic Society, which has been converted into the Rockbund Art Museum. And with the signing of the Treaty of Nanking in 1842, strategically selected coastal locales became the new hubs of globalization's opportunities. In Shanghai, as well as on Hong Kong Island, the establishment of conceded areas, concessions, Zujie in Chinese, were where extraterritorial global trade rapidly grew. In October 1857, uh, the Shanghai Library housed in the Masonic Hall an American Protestant missionary, a highly regarded Chinese linguist, and publisher of the Chinese repository, a Mr. Elijah Coleman Bridgman, was selected the first president of the Shanghai Literary and Scientific Society, which was established the previous month. A plot created from the formation of a new block behind the British Consul's building was leased to the society for its very first building. Designed by the architect Thomas William Kingsmill, the RAS, RAS building opened in 1871 with a reading room, a library of books on the Orient, a lecture hall on the ground floor, and a three years later, it was reported that on the upper floor, there was opened a museum with a zoological and geological collection. The road in front was even renamed as Museum Road, Bo Wu Yuan Lu, quickly outgrowing its premises in 1927. Fundraising began for a new Royal Asiatic Society building. Its facade included elements referring to its use. The motif of the Chinese script could be found in its collection of ancient bronzes, the octagonal windows, the cloud patterns, and so on. The new building, however, did not last so long. Soon the Japanese would take over Shanghai, returning it only when the Chinese Civil War continued with more uncertainty. Many neighboring buildings in the meanwhile were built on the block at this time including the Baptist Publishing Houses, the YMCA, establishing the cultural basis of this block. After the founding of People's Republic of China in 1949, the Royal Asiatic Society, like many expatriate organizations and its members, departed, while its collections and artifacts and the buildings were taken over by the government. After 1989, Shanghai would quickly become dubbed the head of the dragon. Economic liberalization and reglobalization were rapidly accelerated. In the same stro stroke, the recognition of built heritage came to the fore. In 1986, the city listed its first batch of outstanding modern era architecture. The commercial success of these restorations after decades of neglect, as well as the growing numbers of expats and returnees settling in Shanghai in the mid-2000s, who especially appreciated such developments, would not go unnoticed. In the mid-2000s, teams from Tongji University undertook the mapping, surveying, and historical research of areas now called the Rockbund. 
In 2006, the developers also engaged the world famous firm of David Chipperfield Architects in the renovation of the old buildings. Many of the buildings were actually in sad condition. The accumulation of demographic demand and urgent need to house a burgeoning population after liberation, coupled with the lack of resources and neglect, had transformed many of the grandest buildings into informal squalor. Though the Royal Asiatic Society building was somewhat shielded because it had been overseen by the Shanghai Library, its top floors were nevertheless turned into residences as well, and multiple partitions and additions were added throughout the building. In the 1990s, the building itself was even rented to a financial company in the early days of accelerated economic liberalization. David Chipperfield architects were well known for their beautiful renovation of the Neues Museum in Berlin's historical Museum Island District, which had been in ruins since the war, took on a careful restoration and addition project in Shanghai, accommodating the contemporary infrastructural needs as well as addressing the old and new in context. After the opening of the World Expo in May, the Rockbun Art Museum opened in this building in October 2010, the first and the centerpiece of the Rockbun development. The inaugural exhibition of the new museum was a solo show of the international acclaimed Chinese artist Cai Guoqiang, whose work opened the 2008 Beijing Olympics. It was followed by the solo shows of Zhen Fanzhi and Zhang Huan, all well-known representatives of Chinese contemporary art. They set the tone for the museum that would develop an inquiry into both its history and the buildings as well as contemporary developments. If the revival of old buildings in Shanghai in what is branded as a Rakban area for new uses represents the embrasure of newly growing global capital flows, especially after decades of poverty and planned economy. Then the reuse of the former central police station buildings in Hong Kong, a poster child in, in city terms for lazy fair governance and global flows already evokes a very different kind of nostalgia. One of the first buildings of the colony's establishment was built for the first chief magistrate, William Keane, in 1841, who was also charged with the police and the prison. After the police force was established in 1844, the house that was trottily constructed for the magistracy was quickly converted into a prison. In addition to the prisons and the magistracy, retaining walls to secure the site was also built. The rapid growth of prisoners compelled the expansion of the penitentiary buildings and soon the decision to move the police force to the site from nearby Queens Road was also made. With the growth of the city and the building of a more modern infrastructures, the prison site also stopped serving as a convict prison and became a detention center, notably after the Vietnam War for refugees. China's reform and opening further propelled Hong Kong from an Asian tiger of industrial prowess to one that served as a conduit for global capital flows into and out of PRC. Here you can see the rising skyline that gives Hong Kong its famous face today rising with this flow. With opening of the now famous mid-level escalators in 1993 and impending decommissioning and development on the table, the site was declared a monument in 1995. The Tourism Commission and the Economic Development Bureau were charged with the Central Police Station compound's future. One of the proposals in 2004 to convert the site into an arts complex submitted but turned down began to seed a direction for its new reuse. In 2018, Daigun would open to the public after nearly two decades of conceptualization, conservation, and construction. It has since become a central public space and space scarce Hong Kong. The Daigun Contemporary, an institution overseeing the contemporary arts modeled on the Kunsthalle, has also become representative of the development of the arts in the city. The two cases compactly outlined were products of the histories of their cities.
Even though the cities have diverged in their political economies and development trajectories, both have become exemplary for their physical conservation and reuse. It may be important, especially in the context of the series, to now talk a little bit more about reuse in of itself and the making of heritage, and to table the relationships between heritageization, what makes an old building heritage, and the reuse in urban setting. Even though heritageization is often presumed to precede reuse, it's not necessarily the case. There is a certain relationship, of course, here of the past to an ever advancing present. Reuse itself is predicated on an existing physical structure. That structure has a use, or as architects like to say, function, for which it was, its form had been built. In the Shanghai case, the structure that survived had been built, designed, for the uses of the Royal Asiatic Society. Its library of books, its, its artifacts for exhibition display in the museum, its offices, its auditorium, and other amenities. When larger changes take place, the functions for which the building has been designed become no longer valid. In the particular case of Shanghai, we saw that many of the buildings around the Museum Road that has since been renamed Hutiolu became residences in a mix of functions. The structures were thus, in fact, reused. I, di I diverge here very quickly, of course, to mention that the Parthenon in Athens was built originally in the 5th century BC as a temple, and it eventually became a church and then a mosque, and then got damaged by the ammunition stored there in the late 1600s. So the act of reuse is as old as human civilization. The Particular reuse I talk about here, of course, is a re renovation that has taken place in the mid-2000s. In addition to the back to accommodate contemporary infrastructures, is part of the physical transformations to the building itself. It was both a response to a new public plaza that was in a master plan by Gregotti and Associates. It was also needed to accommodate contemporary infrastructures. For many pre-modern buildings that needed to be reused by the contemporary um, audience, infrastructures such as the air conditioning, pipe water, water closets even, lifts are not invisible additions. In the case of the former Royal Asiatic Society building, it was turned into a space for contemporary visual art exhibitions in a new institution that was formed for it called the Rockbund Art Museum. Here, the fundamental tenets of reuse are summarized. We have the original structure and its original function. We have the transformations that have taken place to this original structure, as well as the new functions. One thing the current optimism to pair new uses into old building is the closer look that is very worthy of this matching of original functions that gave rise to the form and the very new functions that we put into old buildings. The Daigun compound, of course, I don't need to unpack so much. We, we can visit all the spaces. Underwent three conceptual design iterations where the volumes were added in response to new uses that cannot always be accommodated in the old buildings designed originally for other purposes. Here, there had been a careful selection of demolitions that had taken place in order that the contemporary functions can work well and in sufficient space. We're in one of the spaces. And I'm showing you here an image I took at the Venice Architectural Biennale in 2010. Um, that was an exhibition about conservation in relationship to architecture itself. It is a debate that has gone back to these two men that you see in the diagram shown a particular Mr. Villeleduc on the <laughs> right, <laughs> and a Mr. John Ruskin on the left. It was a battle of the utmost morality for these two protagonists, or how much new to add to the old, or how much change to make to a building. We know, for example, from European examples, that even if a heritage building looks effortlessly old, microscopically, 
there will always be new elements. Conservation itself is an ongoing process of use and maintenance. For both cases, the way of adding new to the old, especially by two international architects with extensive expertise on both the needs of the new cultural institutions and the renovation of old buildings, have made them very successful spaces for these new uses. In, in addition, of course, to the interior fit, there are visible and honest juxtapositions of the old with the new that are sensitive and responsive to their sites. The honesty of a reality of old and new, which you see from this collection of European examples, not only opens the sometimes impractical ideas of repairing the old as if it's going to be old. In Chinese, which is actually an official policy, the honesty of, of the old and new next to each other also challenges the recent proliferation of new buildings looking more and more old in many places that we see today. If we may segue out of these old buildings to some buildings nearby, the fact that they're not torn down for higher buildings should not preclude a more careful look also at the relationships between these previous functions that have taken place that determine the spatial DNA, their locations, and the new functions that are put into them. Our contemporary conceptions of heritage itself were conceived at a time in the mid-1800s when Western Europe's industrialization, urbanization, nation building were also accompanied by large-scale demolition developments. In reaction to these clearances, an assertion that material artifacts should not be demolished because they harbor values representing our civilizations and cultural identities it was a very much put on the table. An Austrian, Austrian historian, Mr. Alois Riegel, wrote a piece called The Modern Cult of Monuments. In addition to being old, meaning survival, making a building or set of structures valuable and thus heritage, criteria such as historicalness, commemorativeness, and use are also needed to assess the meanings embedded in the physical structures that render them important to us today. Especially in Hong Kong and in East Asia, where change is visibly rapid by historical civilizational standards, the sheer fact that a building has survived or can survive further because it is outside of the jurisdiction of pri pro private property development should also be contextualized again in the urban fabric. The relationships of the old and new is not only objects in the field, but also at the larger territorial scale. In Shanghai, for example, the implementation of heritage laws have reacted to the large-scale demolitions that have cleared away huge swaths of the urban fabric in the city since the 1990s. It was with the realization that not only individual buildings, but areas, which we constantly call fabric, that require protection, that there was an implementation of conservation areas rather than of only buildings that began in the mid-2000s. Within the recent process of also heritageization, the symbolic value of architecture itself should not be overlooked. In Hong Kong, the decided demolition of the 1970s General Post Office, also in Central, perhaps shows it is less the historic civicness represented by the old buildings that have been popularly embraced than that of the meaning, the image of architecture itself. In Shanghai, the demolition of the 1980s Friendship Store you see here on which the peninsula has been built nearby the Rock Bund, it shows again that the architecture image perhaps requires deeper popular, not only scholarly, engagement. The trajectory of economic transition and urban transformations offer important context for understanding the development of the two cases. The buildings of the Rock Bund, of the Bund, and of the former French and international concessions in Shanghai represents the cosmopolitanism of global capital that the city tries to revive. The buildings in Hong Kong have come to represent what many perceive to be local 
identities. For both cities, the rapidly um, developing global east, their unique trajectories have compelled what seemed to be an embrasure of their particular pasts. By looking at the particular processes and pathways for their spatial productions, or in architects' lingo, the architectural type is form and function in their transformation, only then can we start to unpack these sites from the past. As the philosopher Michel Foucault likes to use, the word genealogy emphasizes that the past is not detached, but ever present and of great relevance to us today. To use another Chinese architect's famous adage, if we don't know where we come from, we are standing nowhere. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ying, uh, very much for this fascinating talk. I wonder if we look back and learn about these competing meanings and competing histories, um, what made, if we look deeper into those um, different usages might affect how we conserve these buildings. Because um, I think that um, conservation uh, over the last you know, few decades has moved a long way. Uh, you know, understanding the significance of buildings is very important. However, I think there is still a difference between the official designation or official statement of significance of a building, what it is, versus maybe the more complex histories of these buildings that are not always captured in those official statements. So by understanding and looking back into some of these sort of more complex histories, um, the peoples and the groups who lived in these places uh, maybe that might open up a slightly different ways on approaching how we are going to reinterpret these buildings after they're preserved. Uh, maybe the interpreted, interpretive programs uh, of these places might help us to understand these very complex relationships, um, which is something that I, um, maybe I would like to hear more. I think it's very clear that whenever we talk about heritage, mm. we're looking at it from our present, and this present evolves. So that relationship to that particular history that we have chosen, it's a selection. So that qualification, as Regal would say, is it only the old buildings? Because there are buildings, for example, in Shanghai that are much later, built in the 1990s, that have been heritageized, and for many different reasons, both f functionally, formally, and um, so the age, it's, it's really about what, what does this building mean to us now? Mm -hmm. And that now also changes, so the now, 50 years from now, this now is no longer the now today. So I think that's something to really, um, especially for the students to keep in perspective mm. because history is not static. It yeah. keeps on evolving and that's also fundamental. So heritageization as a process, maybe is something that we need to be a little bit more critical yes. about what goes into the process and, and uh, yes. um, you yes. know, how do we actually capture all these competing values and meanings and mm. associations, which is something that probably is something the voices of the people who ever associated with yeah. that building. Tonight, we have touched on a lot of very interesting uh, points and concepts that we need to rethink about when we talk about the site of Daegun and how we um, and in the heritage department is to provide a kind of interpretation to help the public um, enjoy the site and to understand the complexities of history and what it means to us today and for the future. Thank our speakers tonight for this uh, wonderful program. Thank you.